Pia, he inherited his position in Upper Egypt from his father. And he was not really intending, apparently, because he did not uh, undertake any action there until uh, his reign was well advanced. Historians believe it was either from 752 to 721 BC or 747 to 716 BC that Payanke officially founded the 25th dynasty. Payanke consolidated Upper, Middle, and Lower Egypt by way of victory at Heracleopolis after a five-month siege. His victory included the vital cities of Hermopolis and Memphis. While he ruled and resided in Napata, the capital of Nubia, Payanke allowed the local kings in Lower Egypt to rule at will. Pianchi is best known as being a brilliant military strategist. His father, Kashta, was able to make many political and diplomatic arrangements, but it was the son who was able to conquer the entire society, civilization of Egypt. First, he conquered Upper Egypt, which is the portion of Egypt closest to Nubia and his armies kept moving further and further north until he had finally encompassed Lower Egypt as well. It was a pharaoh, a black pharaoh, in the 25th dynasty that finally united the northern and southern areas of Egypt and brought a, brought a spirit of unity and tore down racial walls and Egypt became the most powerful nation at the time because of these walls being torn down. Uh, he adopted many of the Egyptian uh, mores and, and customs and he became a very, very proud Egyptian pharaoh. Where, where Thutmose III identifies himself as, you know, the strong bull born and uh, arising in Thebes, uh, Pianchi, who uses Thutmose's uh, throne name, also calls himself the strong bull arising in Napata. An individual, a Libyan, one of the parts of the Libyan anarchy, started to unite the various forces and kingdoms in the north of Egypt into a single unit and to prepare for an attack on Pia in the south. Pia marshaled all his forces and in a single year uh, completely defeated the uh, forces of the north. They did not attempt to impose a unitary kind of rule on Egypt at that time, but he certainly established a complete ascendancy over Egypt. His inscription that records it is one of the finest pieces of historical writing in ancient Egyptian. He, he says, gods make a king, men make a king, but Amun made me. So in other words, my kingship is superior to everyone else's and that I'm going to be the emperor. And he took his forces to the Delta. And then finally, when he ended up in the Nile Delta, one of my favorite things, in fact, one of the most clever things that I think any Nubian pharaoh did, was when he held court and he took the obeisance of these Libyan dynasts and other uh, petty rulers in the Nile Delta. He sent most of them away because they'd eaten fish. And as any good Egyptian should know, of course, you can't approach a god, a pharaoh, uh, after having eaten fish because you were ritually impure. So he was telling them how to be Egyptian and favoring the one particular individual who was adhering to those rules and sending the rest away. And that, to me, is just an amazingly clever and sophisticated way of establishing control over the country. Pia is the first one to realize that he could move forward and actually and actually subdue all of these little kingdoms in the Delta and, and Middle Egypt. And really he set the tone and showed that no we can be we can actually have a policy that goes all the way to the sea and maybe beyond into Palestine if we need to. Soon Pae was given a reason to intervene further north. Tefnakte, a Libyan, the prince of western Egypt, ruler of the delta city of Sayez, extended his control south by capturing the city of Memphis and the old middle kingdom of Ichtawe, Lisht. At first, Pae merely checked Tefnakte's movement while moving southward with a pair of naval victories in Middle Egypt. Here, 
he left the Sate rulers in control. However, after spending New Year's in Nubia, Paye returned to Thebes joining his sister, Amenirtis I, in time for the Great Opit Festival, and subsequently set about planning to place the remainder of Egypt under his control. His troops moved north, capturing three towns, and killing one of Tefnakte's sons in the process. After conquering Egypt, Paye went home to Nubia, and according to historians, never again returned to Upper Egypt. This was presumed he didn't need to return due to his strength as a ruler and the lack of conflict under his authority. He is portrayed as a ruler who did not glory in the senseless killing or torture of his adversaries, as did other kings, but rather preferred treaties and alliances. He left the rule of his country largely in the hands of his vassals. During Paye's reign, the entire kingdom enjoyed a resurgence of Egyptian culture, religion, and sophistication. Apparently when Pai returned south to rule from Nubia, Tefnakti reasserted his power. His successor was his son, King Bekenrenath, also called Bacorus, who reigned from the royal palace in Sayas. The Pharaoh Shabago dynasty ended Bekenrenath's reign and attempts to assert Libyan power over Egypt in 715. Bekenrenath was reportedly buried alive. Around 716 BC, Shabaka succeeded his brother, Paye, as king. The Kushites created a new tradition of regal succession, not from king to king's son, but from king to brother to king's son. Shabaka recognized the mistakes his brother made in ruling from the south and set forth on a course to reconquer all of Egypt and to rule from the north. Shabaka was crowned pharaoh of both Egypt and Kush upon the death of his brother, Payanki. It is presumed that he was crowned in Napata and that the Egyptian princess of northern Egypt revolted. Let's assume to take advantage of the transition of power. Shabaka reinvaded Egypt, denoted Memphis as the capital, ruled from there, and established diplomatic relations with the Assyrians in Nineveh. Some historians reference that Shabaka ruled from Thebes, and others believe there existed dual capitals. With the ascension of Shabaka, Egyptian and Nubian history became one. Shabaka, his name in, and in itself means beautiful is the soul of Ra. He was uh, a powerful leader, but he was also a very cultural leader. During Shabaka's reign uh, in the 25th dynasty, there was much building, there was much construction that went on. In fact, during this period, uh, the Nubians built pyramids. Pyat, upon his death, was actually uh, buried in one of these Egyptian-like, these Egyptian model pyramids. Shabaka was known as the builder of the 25th dynasty, particularly in the city of Thebes. In Karnak, there still stands the pink granite statue of Shabaka wearing the twin crowns of Egypt. He was also credited for the restoration of the gate at Karnak. Shabaka also championed the return to the many ancient religious customs of ancient Egypt, particularly pyramid burials, as further evidence of his embellishing Egyptian customs and moors. The most distinguishing literary documentation of his reign is the Shabaka stone. The stone is a slab of nearly black green breccia, stone measuring approximately 66 centimeters in height and about 137 centimeters in width. It was incised with the remaining hieroglyphs of a decaying papyrus that was also worm-ridden. He spent a great deal of time 
in codifying some of the writings that had never been codified or that had been lost, such as what we call the Shabaka Stone or the Memphite theology. This Memphite theology is of profound importance because it is the only written presentation of the fundamental theology that govern large parts of ancient Egypt. It appears that Ptah, especially as he was articulated by Shabaka, was one God. That here we're talking about a monotheistic system. And what is becoming more and more apparent is that the attributes of Ptah are in fact the attributes of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Unlike Payanke, Shabaka did not record his many achievements. Therefore, his activities have largely been recorded through the eyes of others. Question, is Shabaka the so mentioned in the Old Testaments, ruled from Thebes? Do we need to mention his attempt to thwart the Assyrian belligerents by getting Palestine and Syria to revolt? The Assyrian challenge began during the later years of his reign. Now, Assyria was the strongest power in the, at that time, in the 8th century BC, and they were very predatory. The Assyrians had heavy chariotry, heavy cavalry, and they also had heavy armor, bronze-scaled armor, corslets. You see the Assyrian reliefs, the armor is drawn with great detail. Yeah, Shabaka was the main person who faced off initially against the Assyrians. And through a combination of military power and negotiations, he managed to keep the Assyrians at bay. Mainly because he ruled from the Egyptian capital rather than the Nubian capital. Interestingly enough, this standard doesn't apply to any of the other dynasties. He faced a big revolt in Upper Egypt. The Libyan uh, dynasts revolted again. They stayed in power for enough time for uh, this one ruler to be called the 24th dynasty. But uh, Shabako did uh, quash the revolt and uh, executed the uh, rebel. Shabaka eliminated the insurrections in Lower Egypt by defeating the Libyan Bekenrenov around 715 BC. To set an example, Shibaka burned him alive to avert any further rival uprisings. Joshua's scripture about burning. Unlike his older brother, Pae, Shibaka believed in more of a direct, hands-on rulership. With the assistance of his sister, Amenirdis, Shibaka ruled sternly but fairly. Complementing his style of governess, Shibaka was known as the Builder and is noted for massive construction projects directed toward rejuvenating Egyptian culture and religion. The overall control that was exerted by Shibaka in the southern portion of the 24th Dynasty territory in the northern delta is indicated by the vast array of documented building that he undertook during his reign. Specifically on the West Bank, he enlarged the 18th Dynasty temple at Medine Habu. On the east bank, he did renovations at Luxor and at Karnak. He built a structure called the Treasury of Shebaka between the Ahmenu and the northern enclosure wall of the Ayput Aisut. He's also credited with enlarging the entrance to the Temple of Ta. The fourth pylon at Karnak has an inscription that recorded his restoration of the gate. And many historians believe it was probably Shibaka who directed the building work near the future kiosk of Taharka in Montu beside the sacred lake. After eliminating the threat from Assyria, Shibaka reigned in peace and is renowned for being the most prolific builder of the 25th dynasty. It was Shabitku, apparently, who actually had to fight the Assyrians in their first round of battles. And that was long about 701 BC. 
there had clearly been an alliance between Hezekiah in Jerusalem and, and Shabitko. The king of Jerusalem had cast his lot in with the Egyptians, had put his safety in their hands. And I think the Assyrian messenger arrived at the walls of Jerusalem and said, why are you putting your faith in, in the Egyptians? They're like a broken reed that will, if you, if you rest on a broken reed, it will, it will pierce your hand. At just at the moment when the Assyrians were um, besieging and uh, taking Lachish, another uh, town in the kingdom of Judea, the uh, Egyptian army arrived and caught the Assyrians. It wasn't a unified force, they were disconnected. And somehow it was enough to frighten the Assyrians off, and they made some kind of an alliance or a, a treaty not to attack again. It was kind of a stalemate. The Assyrians were turned back, and even as the Assyrians tried to press into Egypt, uh, they were turned back uh, as well and put some limits, put some circumscriptions on how far the Assyrian Empire could extend with regard to a territory that was claimed both by the Hebrew people and by the Egyptians. As is stated in many ancient texts, the Hebrews revered their cultural, economic, and political relationship with the Nubians and viewed them as follows. Ethiopia and Egypt were their strength, and it was infinite. During a period of almost 100 years, the pharaohs of Egypt confronted and defeated primarily the forces of Libya and Assyria as means of providing political stability, peace, economic growth, and cultural rejuvenation throughout the region. One thing we have to say about the 25th dynasty in general here is there was an intense, intense level of reverence and respect for Egyptian culture, Egyptian social mores, e Egyptian lifestyle. So part of uh, their, their dynasty or their reign showed a, if you want to call it a renaissance, of Egyptian culture. At the death of Shabitku, know that Taharqa becomes Pharaoh. It was during his reign that Egypt's nemesis, Assyria, at last invaded Egypt. The Assyrian king, Isar Haddon, led several campaigns against Taharqa, which he recorded on several monuments. Although many historians point out that many of the victories claimed by the Assyrians were exaggerated, and many were actually Egyptian victories. He ruled all of Egypt and northern Sudan. He ruled the areas of the, the deserts, the, the, the oases settlements, and he, he, he had a, his sphere of influence extended well into what we call the Holy Land and up the, up the coast of Lebanon. I mean, all of those city-states were vassals to him, and they looked to him for protection. Taharqa had an exceptionally long reign. He lasted, he lasted quite a while, and both in Egypt and in Sudan, he was considered a great builder. So Taharqa is one of the greatest leaders of the Nubian dynasty, but a kind of tragic figure as well. Uh, on the one hand, he was uh, one of the greatest builders in Nubian history. He renovated temples up and down both Nubia and also in Egypt. He left monuments at Karnak, for example. He also fought against the Assyrians, and here's where he had mixed success. Unfortunately, at that time, the Assyrians decided to uh, come west again and they were going they took the side of the uh, Libyan dynasts in the Delta and they attacked Taharqa but the first attempt was driven off. Isar Haddon's first attack in 677 BC was aimed at pacifying his allies in the Arab tribes around the Dead Sea. This conflict led him as far as the Brook of Egypt. It is generally assumed that Esar Haddon then proceeded to invade Egypt proper into Harka's 17th regnal year after he had settled a revolt 
at Ashkelon. History records that Taharqa defeated the Assyrians on that occasion. The pharaoh Taharqa had a reputation in many domains because he was also a great military leader, he was apparently a great politician, and he was quite a diplomat. And we see that in terms of Tahaka having been called by the Hebrews to help them in their fight against the Syrian invasion of Jerusalem. Well, the Pharaohs of the 25th dynasty, um, my understanding is that um, they were really uh, an important force because the Pharaoh was also the king of Ethiopia at that time. And, um, you know, that was a lot of military power. And so um, Israel, the northern kingdom, was already affected. Samaria was already conquered by the Syrians. A lot of other cities, which you hear in the, in the chapter, into the text, have been uh, already destroyed and annihilated. And here where the challenge for Hezekiah comes, because the Syrians are saying, don't run to the Pharaoh, it's not going to help you. And if he is going to try to help you, will come back as something that you're going to regret anyway. Um, and they're actually trying first to buy the people of uh, uh, Jerusalem to actually submit to the Syrians so they can join forces and continue the conquest further south towards Pharaoh. And so Israel was really now starting to become um, themselves a more mature state. Uh, this is why Assyria really want to actually look upon the opportunity to conquer Jerusalem. If they couldn't actually befriend them, then they can focus further on the south, which will, of course will be the Pharaoh. And this is where it actually puts Israel and Judah, both kingdoms, into the situation of really looking who are their friends and who are their foes. We need to look upon the way that Jerusalem was placed. And so for people coming to trade from the north, um, they will have to pass to Jerusalem to make it towards uh, Egypt. And so it was a very important route. Whoever controlled that route will have had tremendous benefits. There was a, th a threat that if, the, if King Hezekiah did not succumb to Sennacherib, uh, then his army would come and demolish his whole uh, territory. When the Nubian armies marched north uh, into Israel-Palestine, they were marching as allies of Hezekiah, uh, attempting to lift the siege of Jerusalem. And I agree, uh, along with some other scholars, who suggested that in fact the Nubians played a key role in lifting that siege. And in Isaiah chapter 37, 8 through 9, the rumor was a mighty warrior that united the nations was coming. His name was Teraka of Ethiopian southern pharaoh was coming to attack Assyria. They met the Assyrians at El Teca. And the Assyrians, of course, always claim a great victory. Uh, whatever else happened, uh, it would appear that the Kushites did not cease campaigning, the Assyrians did not cease campaigning, but then Assyria left without taking Jerusalem, and apparently the Kushite intervention for the time being succeeded in deflecting the Assyrians. The Bible says that an angel of God smited the 180,000 Assyrians and the next day when Hezekiah arose from his slumber and looked over the walls and saw the 180,000, he was astounded. So immediately the Syrian general um, pulls up all his uh, troops and returns back. That's right. um, I think it's no coincidence that Sennacherib, uh, after the campaign, the Nubian campaign in the Battle of El Tech, uh, when he pulls out of uh, the Le southern Levant, he pulls out for 20 years. And I think that's because he realized that he was overextended, uh, that the combined Nubian and Egyptian armies represented a real threat to Assyrian expansion, and that he had to regroup, consolidate before he could attempt to conquer uh, that part of the world and move on to uh, conquer Northeast Africa. And I think that we would say that, that your question about the angel, the protection of the angel, that that 
would not be realistically or really an angel. That, that is a metaphor uh, for God's intervention, however, and, and uh, we believe that this was in the form, as in Chronicles with the pestilence, this is a form of a plague. I contend that without the uh, participation of the Nubians, we probably would not have had the survival of Judaism as we know today, and thus, perhaps not even, the, uh, the advent of Christianity. I think an area that really has not been sufficiently looked into by scholars is just the connection between Taharqa, the Kushites, and the Hebrews, what in fact was the interaction that would allow for the Hebrews to call on Taharqa and for which it would be of sufficient historical importance that it would even be mentioned in the Bible. It is believed that three years later, in 671 BC, the Assyrian king captured and sacked Memphis, where he captured numerous members of Taharqa's royal family. Taharqa fled to the south to Thebes, and Esar had immediately reorganized the political structure in the north and establish Nico I, the eventual ruler of the 26th dynasty, as king at Sayes. Taharqa, intrigued by the affairs of Lower Egypt, supposedly and he eventually reclaimed what he lost and reestablished himself as pharaoh in Memphis, fanned numerous revolts. Esar hadn't died before he could return to Egypt, so it was left to his heir and son Assurbanipal to once again invade and control Egypt. Three years later, they came back, and then Taharqa was defeated, and uh, part of it, some of his family were taken off to Assyria. And Taharqa really had to go back to Kush. During one of those defeats, Amenadiris dies. That's the st pillar of stability. She's been the co-pharaoh, remember, since her brother, Pai, or Pianki there was probably some void or vacuum of stability and leadership at her death. Asurbanipal defeated Taharqa, who afterwards fled first to Thebes, then up the Nile into his native homeland, Nubia. Taharqa died there in 664 BC and was succeeded by his appointed successor, Tantamani, a son of Shibaka. People sometimes say that because Taharqa was eventually defeated by the Assyrians, that therefore he was somehow unsuccessful or the, the Nubians couldn't stand up to the Assyrians. But it's easy to forget that the Assyrians pretty much had their way in the Middle East during this period. They defeated every army they went up against and usually quite easily. So the fact that Taharqa during his long reign managed to keep them at bay for most of it and even push them back on several occasions uh, is quite an achievement and accomplishment. As the builder, he consolidated this pharaonic culture from basically Meroe in Sudan all the way to the sea, where as, as a single kind of cultural unit. It is believed that Queen Kualhata, depicted on the Dream Stila, is the mother of Tantamani, who became the last pharaoh of the 25th dynasty.